Hi, uh, this is Dr. Parham Galgozlo from uh, San Francisco, California. Today we are going to talk about the tools in the sleep medicine. When I talk to people, they tell me, how do you figure out I have this disease or that disease, if normally there is no blood test for it. First of all, sometimes we do use blood tests, but this is correct. Most of the time in the sleep medicine, there is no blood work and we use other methods to understand what is the problem with the patient and how we can help this person. One of the most important and most powerful tools that we have to decide what's going on with the patient is our interview. I remember my professor, Dr. Chakraborty, always say, did you ask the right question? So questioning and answering is really, really more important part that this sleep doctor can understand what's happening with this person. A lot of questions um, are asked normally in a, a sleep doctor office and they always say why you are asking this much question because it's needed. Um, normally to understand what's going on with the sleep of a patient we have to do a comprehensive evaluation. So the amount of questions is a lot. We have to ask about different aspects of the um, sleep of an individual, the sleep opportunity, the sleep symptoms, wake symptoms, 24-hour schedules, miscellaneous issues, um, symptoms that we can see in uh, more rare diseases, and so on and so forth. So interview is very important and because we want to ask a comprehensive battery of questions um, the interview is normally structured so the sleep doctor goes over a bunch of questions then another bunch of questions then another bunch of questions and at the end I always tell my patients you will have opportunity to ask questions and offer the things that you wanted to offer and ask or information that you wanted to give at the end, and 99% of the time at the end of the um, structured interview, they said, you ask everything, I don't have anything more to offer. Um, when that happens, obviously physical examination is very important. And based on this interview and physical examination, we determine what kind of approach this person needs. Today, um, I'm not gonna talk about approaches, to different patients. However, I'm going to talk about the tools that we use. So I already spoke about two different tools that we have, the physical examination and more importantly, the interview. Sometimes we objectively want to see the pattern of the perceived patient asleep at home. So we give diaries, sleep diary to be done at home, one week, two weeks, and sometimes in cases of insomnia, we need several weeks of a sleep diary to understand when this patient thinks he went to bed, when this patient thinks he fell asleep, when this patient thinks he woke up. Um, it is important to understand that a sleep diary is something subjectively, so your understanding of the reality and sometimes your understanding of reality might be different than the actual reality, which is a known issue. For example, in a sleep misperception cases, um, what they think is happening and what is really happening are completely different. Um, in the sleep diaries, we want to know when this person reports going to bed, when this person reports that he was in the bed and he was awake, and when this person thinks he was asleep and he was in the bed and um, the patterns over days of the week or days of the month will help the doctor to distinguish between a few things. Another very closely related tool that we have is called Actigram. It's like a watch with an accelerometer inside. So when we are awake, we move around and this accelerometer shows movement. And when we are asleep, we don't move around, so the movements go to a minimum. So we can see when this person is awake 
and when this person is asleep implied by the amount of movement and it's pretty accurate even we can understand the little periods in the middle of the sleep that somebody wakes up sometimes for um, restless leg syndrome the studies we put the accelerometer on the legs and we monitor the movements of the leg in the sleep and of course in other neurological conditions it can be used for example if somebody is suspected of a REM behavior disorder we can use that the next and the very important tool that we use in so many different ways to um, understand the sleep patterns of a person is called polysomnogram the early versions of polysomnogram was invented around 60 years ago 50 years ago and um, they became more and more advanced and around 20 30 30 years ago they became computerized and um, it became a lot easier to uh, put all this data together basically we have many many channels of electrophysiological uh, recorded data over time during their sleep for instance different channels of brain waves um, different channels of muscle activity we look through different ways of breathing activity we look at the chest movement and we can categorize them based on the time and what, what's going on in each epoch or 30 seconds of information in relationship to each other and decide when this person is awake when this person is asleep what is the brain activity looking like what is the cardiac activity looking like what is the respiratory activity looking like what is the respiratory effort looks like um, and decide about different things that can be diagnosed during the sleep we have so many different variations of methods that we use the polysomnogram device the regular one we basically look at a few of the brain wave channels and respiratory channels and some muscle channels and we can diagnose sleep uh, disordered breathing we can look into the ekg and look into the cardiac activity of this person cardiac rhythm of the person if there is any cardiac issues like AFib, we can see them. Um, we can increase the brain channels and record a comprehensive battery of brainwave information during the sleep. So um, to use it as a seizure montage, we can um, increase the brain channels and also increase the muscle channels and look at the behavior of this person sometimes we want to look at the muscle activation patterns so we do a lot of different muscle channels and this is all the decision of the treating doctor and how to tell the technician to use the polysomnogram for different um, um, diagnostic concerns that they have the same polysomnogram device can be used as a device to detect the amount of sleepiness during the wake time. Sometimes for people who have too much sleepiness, we use that normally after the night uh, polysomnogram in the morning to look into the amount of sleepiness. We ask the person to try to nap in certain times and try to not nap in certain times and look at how fast they go to sleep and what stage of sleep they get into during the daytime that help us differentiate between different causes of sleepiness. Uh, this test is called MSLT and sometimes it's used for disease detection and sometimes it's used for safety of the performance in high-risk jobs, for example, pilots or truck drivers um, sometimes have to submit to a test like that. Um, also, another variation of this test is called MWT. MWT means um, maintenance of wakefulness. And we look to make sure this person can continue his wakefulness. For example, if somebody is a 
nuclear facility safety officer at all. Um, somebody is a pilot or astronaut or jobs that it's really important that this person be alert and awake in this job. We use that. I had a fighter jet pilot maybe 10 years ago that we had to use this test for him uh, that I remember the job requested it. And uh, it, it's, it's not just the doctor who wanted to do this. Another important part of the um, testing that we do is a nasal endoscopy. We can use a fiber optic flexible endoscope, look into the nasal passages, um, look into the amount of the flesh that is coming from outside of the nose and the placement of that. Um, into the valves in the front of the nose and in the back of the nose, the way the pharynx is. And a variation of that test is called um, DICE, drug-induced sleep endoscopy, that we give some medication to the patient and put them to sleep. And it normally happens in an anesthesiology setting. And we look how the tissue collapses and the airway stops functioning um, during their sleep. Sometimes to decide on some surgical methods, x-rays of the neck, of the airway, of the proportions of the jaw and maxilla, maxillary um, bones, and even the soft tissue is done by surgeons more often. And in certain conditions, we might want to consider MRI of the brain or CT of the neck, functional MRI of um, different portions of brain. Um, mainly in research setting, we do that. Um, sometimes we have to check a specialized labs, like the amount of melatonin based on different times of the 24 hour in saliva or urine. And sometimes we have to use a lumbar puncture to access the uh, cerebral spinal fluid of the patient and check some chemicals there. And that is done in um, normally uh, more sophisticated tertiary care sleep centers um, to look into dubious cases of sleepiness to look at certain types of narcolepsy. One of the most uh, used sleep tools that we have is called home sleep study testing. Um, this is a more flimsy version of polysomnogram with a lot less biosignal channels. And uh, we can basically rule in an sleep apnea with it. Around 15, 20 years ago, it was developed and popularized um, my understanding is it was based on one surgeon request from the um, Center for Medicare and Medicare Services to look into the availability of this test to rolling in the sleep apnea and they were favorable on this and suddenly a lot of changes happen in insurance protocols because this test is most a lot more cheaper than the regular polysomnogram and it's one of the most used tests in the field of sleep medicine. So for the purpose of diagnosis of sleep apnea, um, it was really helpful because it needed a lot less resources and, and um, money involved to diagnose sleep apnea. And it's very popular now. There are testing centers who just do the testing and there are centers who are based on doctor offices who you will see the doctor and they treat you and among the treatment they use different methods that I explain to this site. A lot of time in follow-ups you need repeat of some of these tests, repeat of the questionnaires, so expect that and most the sleep conditions are long-term sleep conditions and Longitudinally, you have to see the sleep doctors and over time, some of these testing have to be um, redone, for example, to see if the pressure of the um, your CPAP device that helps the patient breathing who has a sleep apnea is correct, or 
if it needs any modification and um, sometimes the insurances require the qualification after a few years to see if the patient still has a sleep apnea to continue his treatment so when you become a sleep patient um, for long term you have to follow with your sleep doctor most of the time every few months but a lot of time also on annual basis for insomnia cases normally three four five sessions are done pretty fast at the beginning and then you need a few more follow-up sessions around seven eight session and then every three to six month follow-up um, is needed till um, your insomnia resolve or become to a stable pattern that you can be sent back to the primary care physician. Um, thank you so much for listening and I hope it was helpful. Thanks. Bye-bye.